um, part of the conference, right? So you're probably all exhausted, aren't you? Still enthusiastic or exhausted, but still enthusiastic. That's great news. Let me start my timer. Oops, where's it gone? <clears throat> okay, good afternoon again. Now, this is the first time I've ever done this talk. So I have absolutely no idea how long it will last, okay? So it may last for 25 minutes, 45 minutes, two hours, five hours, I don't know. I have no idea. Probably it will last about 50, 60 minutes, depending on uh, your involvement. And after that, who came to my talk yesterday? Put your hand up if you came to my talk yesterday. Okay? It, as you know, afterwards I will ask you if you want to ask any questions, but my answer will probably be, it depends. You know, experts, when they're answering your questions, they always say, it depends. Now, is anybody using headphones? We don't need any translation, so you can come and listen if you want. The translator guy is <laughs> sitting in there, and, and there's nobody to translate for. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, he's, are you? Or are you listening to music? <laughs> he's got different headphones in. Okay, just one note about mobile phones. If you came yesterday, you know that I like you using your mobile phones, but today, no mobile phones. So can you please put your mobile phones in your bag? If I find an activity, I want you to use them. I will ask you to take them out. If I see anybody checking their mobile phone during my talk, you have to stand up and sing a song. Is that okay? <laughs> it's good, fair, okay. Uh, you you want to? Oh, that's clever. That's so clever. Okay, you can take photographs, but um, and you can take photographs of the screen if you want. <coughs> um, and uh, but I, if I catch anybody looking at their phone and checking Facebook or something, then there will be trouble. All right. So for anybody who doesn't know, my name is Ken Wilson, and the title of this talk, a talk I have never done before, so I'm quite nervous, is reducing fear increasing confidence, how to reach students who think that learning English is an ordeal, okay? I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference. This is the conference logo. You can't see it, so there's last year's conference logo, which is much more visible. And I'd like to thank the British Council who made it possible for me to be here. Now, to begin with, you've all been working, you're a fantastic group of teachers, really. You, you are. Did I hear a thank you? Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, really, you are. I mean, this conference, I, I see a lot of enthusiasm, as you said, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. And I'm going to ask you to do one or two things for me to increase the amount of energy. Because before we do anything else, we're going to talk about success. Um, now, success, what is success? Success is when you pass an examination, right? You pass an examination, you are successful. No? Not necessarily? It you don't think that? <laughs> it depends. OK. You don't think that's a, a successful? I was successful. I, I failed because I passed the exam. Is it not a kind of success, passing an exam? It's a kind of, it's a kind of success. I, I know I'm just trying to look at different possibilities. Running a marathon is also a success, right? Baking a pizza that people want to eat is a success. But for me, I think the most important thing is that success is a state of mind. And it's a very important state of mind if you want to be a teacher. When you walk into the classroom, you have to hope that your lesson plan will be a success. It's even more important in the minds of the students. So here's an idea which will help you with your students to achieve a sense of success. Can you all please stand up? Everybody stand up. Ooh. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. There's some people think, if I sit down, he won't notice me. Yes, I can see everybody. Right. Is everybody standing up? You can sit down if you have a wooden leg, as I said yesterday, or if you're pregnant, right? Or if you're pregnant with a wooden leg, which is quite unlikely. Now, I'm going to look at success in terms of this place. What happens at this place? Tennis, okay? One of the major four tennis championships in the world. I want you to imagine you are in this place. Um, tournament at Wimbledon. You are in it. Don't, don't do that. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> and you're in the tournament where there's one player on this side and one player on this side. What is, what is that called? What kind of tennis is that? Singles. singles. Thank you. And it's the last game of the singles tournament. So it's the... So it's the... Final match. Of what? 
Right, so it's the singles final, right? <laughs> it's the singles final. And it's the last point of the game when you can win the game. What is that point called? Hmm? Match, point. Match point. Well done. You're my tennis expert from now on, okay? <laughs> and in the championship, we call it the championship point. So I want you to imagine that you are in the Wimbledon final and it is championship point and you can win. Okay, are you ready? Because you can be successful. You're looking nervous already. Don't be nervous. You can win. If you are a woman, this is your opponent. Possibly the finest woman tennis player of all time. <laughs> but don't worry, you can beat her. You're looking nervous. Don't look nervous. You will beat her. What's her name? And if you're a man, this is your opponent. This nice young man from, where's he from? Uh, he's from Scotland, actually. <laughs> if, you, if he was here <laughs> and you said he was from England, he's a very, very strong Scottish nationalist. His name is? What's his first name? Uh, Andy. Right, OK, so these are your opponents. So I'm going to have to put my microphone down. Sorry, Mr. Translator. Because I want you to imagine it. And you're, you're about to serve. So get the ball in your hand, please. Get the ball in your hand and bounce it. Bounce it. <laughs> it is not volleyball. You've got to catch. Bounce, catch. Bounce, catch. Okay? Come on, let, let me see your firm now. You're going to have to sort of start making eye contact across the, across the net. Bounce. All right, are you ready? And get the tennis racket in your other hand so you may have to change hands with the ball. <laughs> you're bouncing with your good hand. Right. Okay, are you ready? So after three, we're going to serve. And then, wait, 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 wait. One, two, three. Are you ready? One, two, three. And serve. <laughs> that was truly bad serving. At Wimbledon, the only way you can win the tournament is if you make a loud noise when you serve. Okay? This noise is called a grunt, particularly if you're a woman. Women can only win Wimbledon if they know how to grunt. I right? object. Huh? I object. You object? Right. Yes. <laughs> Not only women do that. No, I know, I know. But, but men, let few. More women finalists. And we can do it I, 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 saw, I saw the, it's unbelievable. Statistically, women who grunt reach the final more than men who grunt. Okay? Right, because men who grunt tend to be East Europeans and they don't get into the final. Right, so here we are. This, apart, apart from Djokovic, of course, who's serving. Right, so are you ready? This time I want to hear a good grunt. So here we go. And serve and... Oh, that, that was good. <laughs> it wasn't great grunting, it was only good grunting, okay? So, come on, feel yourself, feel the sense of, uh, and look across at that word, Serena, look across at Andy. Andy. Here they are. Okay, yeah, you look that way, and you, you look them in the eye, you can beat them. So let's try that, let's practice it one more time. And up, and... Oh, that's not bad, but unfortunately hit the net. Okay, so here's your second serve. This is it, second serve for championship, and serve! Oh. Win? Yep. Yes! Congratulations. You're all Wimbledon champions. The poor translator didn't hear any of that in, in his booth. Okay. I really recommend doing that with your students. Okay? It, it starts off a little bit physical. physical. A physical start to the class is sometimes quite good. And it gives them a sense of success. And let me just show you a cartoon I found on Google Images. I suggest you go on Google Images and find this cartoon and show it to your students. Because students who are not successful in your class think that everybody else, for everybody else, it's easy. The students who have a problem with English in your class look around at students who seem to be okay, and you, the teacher, who speaks English very well, and they think you've got, you know, it's all easy. But tell them every success is based on all kinds of things, not only hard work, but failure. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fail as part of your learning process. I think it's very, very important. You're all going, yeah, yeah. But you know, you don't tell the students that enough. Mistakes are good. And when students make a mistake, you should say, that's a fantastic answer. I, I, I see where you were coming from when you answered that question like that. It's not actually the right answer. If you say no to a student, they think, I can't do it. I'm a failure, OK? So, what, so I suggest you find that. It's very easy to find. Just Google success, the iceberg illusion, into Google Images, and you will find it, and you can use it in class. OK. So my two questions are, how do we reduce fear? 
How do we reach students who think that learning English is an ordeal? Can I just say something negative about teachers for a moment? There are some teachers who believe in power. They walk into the classroom, I am the one who knows, you don't know, so just listen to me. Now I know that people here are not this kind of teacher, because teachers like that don't go to conferences. Teachers who come, no I'm serious, teachers who come to conferences are looking for new ways. Teachers who have a sense of power already know how to teach. They know how to teach, they know the right way to teach is to control your class and show them that you know more than they do. That is not a good way to teach. That unquestionably makes students frightened, okay? A sense of power by the teacher and teachers who smile when you make a mistake, okay, and say no happily, they create immense fear amongst the students. And you are not that kind of teacher. So why am I telling you that? Well, because, you know, I think you're the kind of teacher, the student walks in, you're smiling and say, hi guys, good morning, we're going to have a good time today, right? You're that kind of teacher, you try and make the lesson interesting and enjoyable. But that can also be frightening for some students because they don't want to disappoint you. So you lose both ways, either you're power crazy and your students are frightened, or you're friendly, accessible, and the students don't want to upset you. So we have to try and find a way to help these students. Okay, but I have a question before this. You've got to ask, are the students scared or are they bored? Are they scared or are they bored? Because, you know, the symptoms are the same. <laughs> the students look like this. The kind of eyes turn into glass. And I think we should just look at boredom to start with. Why do students get bored? Anybody want to suggest why they get bored? Um, sometimes they don't understand. They don't understand. Very good. It's the way the teacher teaches. It's the teaching method, right? Interesting. The teacher isn't prepared. The teacher, the teacher isn't, prepared. isn't prepared. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new there. Content. Content. Mm -hmm. Nothing new. There are all excellent answers. <laughs> that's brilliant. No, that's brilliant. I yeah. Not motivated. Ah, oh, my my motiv Did you come to last year? Because I did my motivation talk last year. Okay. Well, it's funny. I did a little bit of research on this. I don't often do research, and I found some very good papers. And it said quite interestingly, students get bored when they sit too long. Not just children. You're sitting down a lot, aren't you? No, you've, you've already stood up, it's okay. They sit too long. The teacher talks too much. I'm talking too much already. It's all talk and no action. Things are complicated. The students can't relate to the material. They're tired and the lesson is boring, okay? So as far as I can see from researching two papers on it, these are the seven most common reasons why students get bored. So what can we do about it? Let's look at the first one. They sit too long, what's the answer? activities move around let them move around the teacher talks too much shut up <laughs> stop talking it's all talk and no action what's the answer do something okay things are complicated what's the answer simplify the complications you know a lot of teachers this is not I understand this but teachers particularly non-native English speaker teachers like most of you are you feel this Terrible need to, to show how much you know. I completely understand that, okay? There is a big difference between being a nest, a native English speaker teacher like me, and a non-nest like most of you. Summarize by one thing. If a student says to me, Ken, what's the difference between buy and purchase? I remember, because this is one from when I worked in Spain, and this student said, teacher, what is the difference between buy and purchase? I said, purchase, pur oh, purchase, right, okay. And then you think, um, I, I purchase is a bit more formal. Let me check. Let me just go and check on, on an online dictionary. If a native speaker teacher says that to the student, the student goes, hey, I asked him a question he doesn't know. Isn't that great? But if one of you tried, and that's a perfectly reasonable thing to ask, I need 24 hours because I think this, but I want to check. I want to check in an online dictionary, then they, have, they think, hmm, she doesn't speak English. 
That is, there's a big, big difference between being a nest and a non-nest. But my belief firmly is people should learn English first from the person who speaks their own language and who learnt English in the same way they did, like you. I'm a firm believer in non-nest teachers, particularly for beginners, but all the way through. Because by advance, it's really nothing to do with uh, whether you're a native speaker or non-native speaker. It's about your methodology. Okay, so keep it simple. You don't have to complicate English. It isn't really that complicated until it gets to advance. They can't relate to the material. The students can't relate to the material. The obvious answer is to personalize it in some way. Make it relate to them in any way you can. They're tired. What's the answer? Huh? Give them a break. If you want to go to just walk around the room, you know, do something. And the lesson is boring, make it interesting. It's not that difficult to make your lessons interesting. I think there is a reason number eight, and it's to do with technology. A lot of teenage students I've watched, I don't teach anymore, but I watch a lot of classes. And the moment the teacher says, switch off your phones, it's like a smoker being told that she can't smoke. You know, <laughs> I'm getting on this plane for two hours, I can't smoke. I'm in a class for an hour, I can't use my phone. So that's why I do believe that you should use your students' phones in the classroom uh, at certain points, because their technology is a lot more sophisticated than your technology is in most classrooms. OK. But the point about my talk is I want to talk about things that people found frightening. So my research for this was very simple. I went on Facebook, and I asked a question. I want you to give me a sentence about your school days beginning, I used to dread. A, a sentence beginning, I used to dread about your school days. I have 4,000 Facebook friends, and 3,999 of them are English teachers. So they were all teachers. So not surprisingly, a lot of them didn't like maths. Anybody here like maths at school? Oh, you said I knew there'd be people who completely ruined that as an idea. You like English and maths at school? Well, no, Arabic's a language, so English, liking English and Arabic is, is, that's the same thing, it's a language, but liking English and maths is quite unusual. Well done, you're either a genius or you're just crazy, you know, you just enjoy, enjoy learning, you enjoy learning, that's good. So the point is, so that, no, but seriously now, I asked on Facebook and I got about 120, 130 replies, uh, different things that my, my mainly teacher friends, right, so these are not people who found uh, school horrible because they enjoyed something, and this is what some of them said. The first one, my friend Joy, she's not a teacher. I used to dread maths. I once got a really good mark in a mock exam. A mock exam is a practice exam, right? The next exam I got 2%. The teacher delightedly pointed this out to the entire class. I don't think I ever bothered trying after that. Can you see the problem already? Problem there is the teacher response. The teacher delightedly pointed it out. That's the power mad teacher. I used to dread maths again. Even after my first year of studying English at the university, I would wake up in the middle of the night having nightmares about not having my homework and the teacher telling me off and giving me a bad mark. We're getting a, 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 some uh, constant things here, aren't we? Bad attitude by the teacher and the importance of getting a mark in an exam. This is why exams are so terrible. I used to dread math classes, oh, not again because the teacher wasn't flex enough, I suppose flexible enough, and sometimes when she wasn't satisfied with the answers I gave, she was grimacing. Do you know this word, to grimace? <clears throat> to put a horrible face. All those three examples have something to do with the teacher. The teacher, and I remember they said, I used to dread. So they, they would go into that classroom feeling cold and frightened about going into the classroom because of that teacher's attitude. But these are arty people, English. Surely they didn't have problems with things like art. Yes, they did. I used to dread art. I think because we'd be told to make or paint something, and I didn't know where to start, what to do, how to do it, or anything. I don't remember being taught any techniques. Interesting, we think art is a creative thing. Language is a creative thing. Surely, at a certain level, students can do what they want in language and in art. No, they need techniques, they need some structure. I used to dread art classes. I have no talent in drawing and painting. I was hard working but without flair for it. I put that one in because that's more about the student than the teacher. Why, at primary school, did she think she had no talent? Where did that come from? Did any of you feel that when you were, small, you know, when you were at primary school? You already think, I can't do this. How does that happen to kids? 
If we can find this, the, do you think it's always the teacher's fault? Yes. Parents as well. Oh dear, we have no control over that, do we? We have no control over these parent, these awful parent people. Yeah, but I think it's really interesting. I have no talent. She already knew that at primary school. <clears throat> I like this one. I used to dread technical drawing classes because I hadn't a clue what it was, how to go about it, or what I should be doing in class. It was like the teacher was using a different language. P.S. I scored 9% in the final test. Keeps coming back to teacher attitudes and testing. Everybody gets affected by testing. Interesting. But what about language lessons? Now, this is Marjorie Rosenberg. I don't know if anybody knows her. She is actually the president of IATEFL, the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language. She's the number one person in our business, right? She's American. She lives in Austria. I dreaded French class because we were supposed to speak before we had the chance to see how words were written. And the sounds alone just didn't make sense to me. Now, I have a problem with this one because as a teacher of English, I prefer that my students hear the words, process the sounds before they see them. French is different. German is different. They're more logical. But English, let's just read this. Just read this. Read it aloud if you want to, to yourselves. Just look at this poem about the English language and pronunciation. Do you want to try and say it together? <coughs> I'll say it, and you can, if you, you can follow me if you want. Everybody together, after three. One, two, three. Just compare. Huh? And diet. But be careful how you speak, say. This, this man is a vicar, but he smokes a. So that's a stress one. You can go to. Try to say. Then say, I love this line. <laughs> Why, who wrote English? Who wrote English, honestly? It's a disaster. Why do we try and teach this ridiculous language? It's impossible. So I have a problem with, with Marjorie's, um, oh, by the way, and if you don't know, do you know that poem? It's about 40, it's about 100 lines long, and this is the man who wrote it. He seems to have a very big brain, right? But he's actually not even English, he's Dutch. His name was Gerard Nols Trinité. He was, uh, lived in the late 19th, early 20th century. If you want to find the whole poem, it's called The Chaos. So if you write his name down, you can find all the poem on the internet, just, just to practice yourself every morning before you start work. Okay, but that's the reason why I personally think that you need to hear the words first. You might not agree with me. And the problem these days is that, of course, your students, they go away from the classroom and they have access to all kinds of reading material online and you don't know how they're pronouncing the words. These days, your students have a lot more chance to learn outside the classroom. You have no control over how they learn and that's why a lot of teenagers today know lots of fantastic words but don't know how to pronounce them. So as I say, I'm not sure what to do with that one. However, look at this one. My daughter used to dread French lessons because the teacher made students read aloud. And Damien, I used to dread history classes because our teacher would make us read aloud. Now yesterday, I don't know if that person is here, somebody did, did a talk called The Joys of Reading Aloud. And there are some nice ways to read aloud. But I have to tell you that saying, open your books at page 26, read the first line, read the second line, read the third line, is not a very sensible activity. Okay, and I told you I spend most of my time watching other people teach these days because I'm researching, writing a new book. And the number of times I see a teacher say, okay, we have a, 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 a visitor in the class, Mr. Wilson from England, say hello, Mr. Wilson. Hello, Mr. Wilson. Open your books at page 26, read the first line. It happens so many times, and I'm going, and the, in your head, uh, Mount Everest is a mountain on the glacial rock, which is a and the second one goes, Mount Everest is And at the back, I have no book, I can't hear a word. And everybody else is just reading it. Nobody's actually listening to the person at the front who's reading aloud. So every time, oh, and I should also tell you, I always offer to do a little lesson at the end of the lesson if I'm watching another teacher. So I say to the teacher, you know, if you run out of material, just let me um, uh, do the lesson. 
Once when I was in uh, Ukraine, Ukraina, Ukraine, um, I went into a school in the I don't know why I'm telling you this. I went into a school in the morning, and it's a beautiful, in a beautiful city called Lviv in western Ukraine. And the only problem in Lviv is that they regularly have a power cut, which nobody knows about. So suddenly, all the lights go out. So one morning, I walked into the front door of this um, school, and a woman came towards me and said, good morning, Mr. Wilson. My name is Vas uh, Natal Natalia Vasiliuk, and I'm the head teacher. And she shook hands with me, and all the lights went out. I said, that's a very clever trick. How did you do that? <laughs> and she said, oh dear, a power cut. So we walked upstairs in the dark. Right, and through the window of the classrooms, I saw these children. They all had a candle under their desk for this very event. So they're all lighting candles. It looked really nice. Each of the rooms looked like a nice little French restaurant. <laughs> and so I went to the end of the corridor, opened the door, and there was a tall woman with blonde hair holding a cassette in her hand. And when I walked through the door, she didn't say, good morning, Mr. Wilson, how are you? She went, nah! like that because, of course, she had no electricity and wanted to use a cassette. I'm not stupid, I could see the problem. So I walked up to her and said, don't worry, if you run out of material, I can take the rest of the class. She went, thank you so much. And she turned to the class and said, boys and girls, this is Mr. Wilson, he is your teacher. And she sat down. And I stuck with them for 45 minutes. Anyway, the point is, I always try and do part of the class for them. And so when I see these teachers saying, open your books, read the first line, read the second line, read the third, which for me has absolutely no educational value whatsoever. And I'm sorry if people like doing that, but it really doesn't have any educational value whatsoever. At the end of the class, I say, I was very interested in your lesson. Um, for example, you asked the students to read a line aloud each. Why? And she said, they almost all said, well, if they don't do that, they don't get any speaking practice. I thought, that is not speaking practice. Reading aloud is a, quite a skill. It's a very skillful thing that only trained actors do really well, right? Ordinary people like you and me reading their own language don't make it sound very good. So, I, so if I can do one thing today, don't read aloud. You can read aloud instructions to each other. Give one of them an instruction how to do something, the other one has to follow the instructions. There's lots of good ways of reading aloud in the class, but sitting, reading a line each, from a, a reading text is not the way to do it. So I absolutely agree with these ones. And this one, of course, you see, in both cases, it caused fear. It caused fear amongst the students. They didn't like to do it. So it's not only a, a useless teaching technique, it also is one which causes the students to feel frightened. So what have we learned from all of this? I think there are five messages. Don't single out a student for criticism. I'm sure you don't need to be told these things. But in your classroom, don't say, that wasn't very good. Don't tell an individual student in front of the rest of the class that they didn't do well. That is the worst possible feeling for that student to have. The second thing is kind of related. You know, if your students are having problems with English, don't hit them on the head even more, you know? Recognize the fact that some of your students are always going to have problems and just try and find a way around it. Try and find some positives. I love your handwriting, <laughs> you know? Your, your English is terrible, but your handwriting is beautiful. Find something nice to say about your students. Don't grimace that word that comes up again. Don't make an, an ugly face when they answer a question, you know? I know we, we, we can't help it. It's, and again, watching other people teach. I'm aware of the fact the teacher gets alarmed because I'm there and the student makes a mistake. So you're saying, answer the question, answer the question. And they make a mistake and they go, ah! Like they've got an electric shock, you know? That's not good for the students. Don't ask students to do something if you haven't trained them to do it. Don't ask students to read aloud. They really don't like reading aloud, okay? Believe me. Most students, even, but the ones who do, have a very strange attitude to learning language anyway. Now, those are the messages. There's a big problem with all those messages, which is the first word. They're all negatives. They're all, I'm not offering you any good ideas here. I'm just telling you what not to do. So now, finally, I can start with my seven strategies, although the first one is a negative. Are you ready? My first strategy to reduce fear and also boredom in the classroom is stop teaching grammar. Stop making grammar the most important thing in your class. Do not walk into the classroom saying, today is the present perfect. It sounds like today there is no lunch, you know? <laughs> I met an American woman once uh, in, working in Spain. I was watching her class. 
And she was delighted that I was coming in because she was a wonderful, she was a wonderful teacher. She had a wonderful attitude. No, I mean, I'll, as you'll see why I'm not certain whether, she was a wonderful, the, the students loved her. Let's put it that way around. The students absolutely adored her. She said, today I'm going to teach the um, present perfect. Um, no, is that right? Yes. Um, no, no, so I, I'm going to treat the second conditional. That was it. So I'm going to treat the second conditional. And my students love learning grammar. I thought, oh, good. OK, well, I, I've never seen students who went, hey, grammar, you know, but I'll, I'll see. So we went into the classroom, and she was lovely. She said, hi, everybody. And they all went, hi, in the kind of same accent. I thought, this just sounds a little bit like they're brainwashed, but never mind, you know. She said, <laughs> And today, she's so theatrical, we have a visitor. Ken, say hi, Ken. And they went, hi, Ken. I thought, I'm scared, I'm scared. Mummy, I'm scared of all this, you know? And she, and she said, okay, sit down. Today, we are going to do the second conditional. And they went, yeah. I thought, that's incredible. <laughs> they really are excited. But they were excited because it was her. She could have said, today, we're gonna, gonna go up in a hot air balloon. Yeah, you know, she, they just liked her style. But then, and this is the interesting part, she said, okay, second conditional is like, if I had a million dollars, I don't, I'm a teacher, a little joke, you know, if I had a million dollars, I would, I would, I'd, I'd, I'd buy a car, I'd buy a new dress, I'd go on holiday. She did about 19 examples, one after the other. And she said, any more examples? And the kids said, no, you have all the good ones there. <laughs> You know, so she sold grammar like a salesperson, right? She sold it. But I still don't think teaching grammar is a good idea in the sense that I don't like the use of grammar words. Look at this blackboard. There are two things wrong with this blackboard. One, there are decontextualized words. I, you, he, she, it, we, they. Never write decontextualized words on the board. Always give them a context. And the other thing that's a problem is that it says pronouns at the top another grammar word, which bores half of your class and frightens the other half. So stop teaching grammar. And if we don't teach grammar like that, how do we teach it? Well, you can have a conversation, quite simply. You can tell a story. You can draw a diagram. Look, here's a diagram. It's about the past tense, but it doesn't say past tense on it, right? Stop writing grammar expressions on the board. If I can stop you doing anything, is stop using grammar expressions. Use a cartoon to introduce it. Look at this nice cartoon here. Read the cartoon. Why is that supposed to be funny? You didn't laugh, but why is it supposed to be funny? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Do you not have that tradition that elephants have a very good memory? The point is, out of this cartoon, I can teach you elephants never forget. Elephants never forget. And when you use the word never, that's where it goes. Not elephants forget never, or never elephants forget. Elephants never forget. That's where it goes. I'm giving you an ex a cartoon to, to give you an example of a structure. I'm not going to use a grammar expression like frequency adverbs. I tell you, I get so upset when I walk to my Good morning, class. And then the teacher turns away and writes frequency adverbs on the board. I think I'm going to struggle to stay awake for the next 45 minutes. OK, so there's another one. Use a cartoon. Do something physical. Let's do something physical. Um, who is this man? And remember from yesterday, I don't care if you get it wrong. Just shout out who you think it is. <laughs> right, anybody? <laughs> yes. Anybody know who it is? Voltaire. Sorry? Voltaire. So who? Voltaire. Voltaire. I wanted to get a wrong answer first. <laughs> Voltaire, excellent answer. It's not Voltaire, but thank you very much for trying. <laughs> Too many of you know the right answer. <laughs> yeah? Is it Mozart? Who? Mozart. Mozart, another excellent answer. It's not Mozart, no. <laughs> Sorry? Newton. I know, they all had it on this table, so I had to keep them quiet. It's Isaac Newton, supposedly the most famous uh, scientist in the world. I did a, a, t a different talk involving Isaac Newton when I was in Brazil. And I said, I want to talk about Isaac Newton. And all these Brazilian teachers said, who? I said, Isaac Newton? They said, never heard of him. I thought, oh, OK, maybe Isaac Newton isn't the most famous uh, scientist in the world. But I was in, actually, a science uh, lecture room. And there were images of famous scientists all the way around. I said, he's there on the back wall. So they all turned around and went, 
Oh, he's like a new tone. Okay. <laughs> it's just about pronunciation. Okay, his name is Isaac Newton. If that helps, okay. Now, I'm going to do a reading text about Isaac Newton, which actually incorporates a grammar point. So I, I, how can I do this and not make it boring? I'm going to get the best-looking young man in the class. Stand up, please. Stand up. I get a nice, good-looking boy who's sitting at the back of the class. Come and stand here. You know, the ones who sit at the back and lean against and go, I'm too cool for school all the time, right? And now he comes out of the front. He's so nervous. I say, you don't have to say anything. Don't worry. You have to say nothing at all. Boom. Then he sees all his favorite girls looking at him. And he goes, hmm, do you, do you have mixed sex schools here or not? It yeah. doesn't matter. Anyway, now I want you to be a tree. I want you to be a tree. Can you be a tree? Can I see some branches? <laughs> I want to see, that's the branch, is it? <laughs> Can I see a slightly bigger branch? That's perfect. Okay. Right. Now, put, take your headphones off for a minute. Take your headphones off. Right. I got another boy out and say, right, got another boy. Where, where's the branches? Right. Stand behind the branch. Stand behind the branch. Right. Okay. Behind the, put your head there. No, put your head there. Here. Your head there. Your head. Because you are the apple. You're the apple. Okay. And then... Is it the green or red? <laughs> it's a red one. Because like, right. And then I ask, how would you come? I ask a student to come out, usually a girl, I find it works best with a girl, and say, you are Isaac Newton, but now you're a woman, so you can be something else Newton. What would you like to be? Another name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take a seat, take a seat. But you're something Newton. You're a female Isaac Newton. So what's her name? Give her a name. Lisa. Huh? Lisa. What? Lisa. Lisa. Lisa Newton. Is she a famous pop star or something? <laughs> right. So this is Lisa Newton, the woman who... What did, what did uh, Newton do? Something about, something about gravity. Something about gravity. Something about gravity. I have no idea. I don't understand physics. Okay. Now, but the point is, you were sitting under a tree when you got this idea, when the apple fell on your head. So I want to ask you, why, why were you sitting under the tree? Relaxing. Okay. Why were you relaxing? Because I was tired. Why were you tired? <laughs> reading books. <laughs> ah, you were tired from reading books. What were you reading about? Um, <laughs> uh, scientific books. You were, re you were reading a scientific book and you got very tired, so you went outside and you sat under the tree. And ladies and gentlemen, when she was sitting under the tree, this happened. Apple, fall. Badumph, okay? Thank you, boys. You were excellent. Weren't they good? Give them a round of applause for being a good apple and a good tree. <clears throat> okay? Yeah, off you go. So this is just a, a way to just change it, make it a bit physical, make the grammar idea physical, okay? <clears throat> and, and, oh, you can't, that says grammar at the top. The point is, the book that you're using has a grammar section at the back. There are students in your class who need to read grammar. They can do that at home. Let them do it at home if they're crazy about grammar. Do not use grammar words in your class. Uh, use contextualized examples, as many as you like, okay, with the same thing. But stop writing, this is the present perfect tense. This is the impact, all these strange expressions that we use about grammar. Okay. Number two. Devolve responsibility. This means give responsibility to other people because we spend most of our time giving instructions to the class. Now tell me, because I have no idea where any of you work. Do any, who teaches teenagers? Anybody teach teenagers? Just a few. What do you, what, do you teach in, do you teach primary? Who teaches primary? Okay, and who teaches tertiary, university? So what do all the rest of you, come on, some of you are not putting your hands up. Stop being difficult, don't be difficult. Who teaches primary? Put your hand up. I'm not going to ask you what you do, I promise. Okay, who teaches secondary? Okay, all right. And who teaches tertiary, third level? There's a whole bunch of people did not put their hands up. Come on, stop being... What? 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 Kindergarten. Did I not say kindergarten? Who teaches kindergarten? Oh, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Okay. Wow, that's okay. But the point is, <clears throat> how many... I'd like to just concentrate on teenagers for a moment, okay? How many students would there be in a, a class of teenagers in a state school? How many? 25. About right, 25? 30, 35. 33. Easy. I've been working in China where high school students, there are 75 students in the class. 75 students in the class. 30 is easy. Let's imagine there are 30 students in the class. With a new class, with a new class, 
How long does it take you to know who are the best students in the class? How long? From the first period. I, I would agree with that myself. You would agree, you, very quickly, you know who are the best classes. Now, this is my idea. I've been talking, this is, this is a new talk, but this is an old idea which I've used often, and I really recommend it. You have 30 students, you have 24, you divide them into three, that's the point. And you try and work out over the first couple of lessons who are the top one third of your class. 30 students, you need 10. And at the end of a class, you say, Will the following people still see me after the class? Which even in the 21st century is terrifying, you know? So you ask the, the top 10 to come and see you when the other students are out of the room. And they're very anxious, what have I done wrong? And you say to them, you are the best students in the class. And they go, uh-huh, <laughs> what's the catch? You know? I said, no, it's great, I'm really impressed by you. After two lessons, I find your English standard, your, your level of understanding what I'm doing, very, very impressive. Give them some uh, praise about just after two classes. However, with this brilliant ability of yours comes a responsibility. From now on, when I ask you to get into groups, I'm gonna ask you 10 to stand up and make a group with two other students in the class, not with each other. Occasionally, you can let them work with each other, the best ones. But for the first couple of days after that, you say to them, OK, get into groups. And these 10 students, by magic, stand up, and they form a group with two other students, OK? And then you give them a task. And then in this smaller group, the ones who aren't so certain can ask the one who knows what they're doing what they're supposed to do. I want to tell you a little story. Does anybody here speak Spanish? It's enough like Arabic. You'll be able to understand from the Spanish and the Arabic. They're so similar. Okay. I watched a wonderful talk about 20 years ago now from a Spanish woman in a, a conference who said, she looked at me and two other native speaker presenters. She says, you people keep telling us we have to speak English all the time in the classroom. And I thought, do I? I don't remember saying that. But she said, it is impossible for my students to speak English all the time, especially when they're working in groups. So, from, so I decided to experiment and said, just talk to each other, but I need you to do the task. And she played a tape. She used to put, she put a cassette recorder. This is how long ago it was. She put a cassette recorder on each table. And you, what you heard was her say, please make a list of places where people work. And then student A said, ¿Qué tenemos que hacer? What do we have to do? And student B said, Tenemos que hacer una lista de trabajos. We have to make a list of jobs. And the third student who had a funny voice said, No, creo que no. <laughs> he had a really sweet voice. He said, Creo que hacer una lista de lugares de trabajo. Sorry, do you want to try the Spanish as well? Um, uh, we have to make a list of places where people work. And the first one said, which doesn't need translating. And he said, Voy a preguntar al profe. I'm going to ask the profe, the teacher. He said, Profe. She said, Yes. He said, ¿Qué tenemos que hacer? She said, ask me in English. So back to her, she wanted English. He said, what we have to do? What we have to do? And he said, you have to make a list of places where people work. And the third student said, ¡Ajá! Tenía razón. I was right. Now, apart from showing how fantastic my Spanish is, okay, the point of that story is they were working. They were working as best they could. Some students are too embarrassed to say to the teacher, I don't understand. They will ask another student. If you organize the groups so you've got one of your better students with two of your, how should we say it, not so good students, it helps. And you've never told the other students that they are in the other groups. They know for themselves anyway. You only told the best students. I think this is a very, very good um, system. And this is how it works. Just look at it again. Tell the top third of your students you need their help. When you want to do some group work, let your top students organize it. Tell them to organize groups of three. Encourage them to help weaker students and allow them to speak their own language to each other. I think this is a very, very good system. Not only to, to save you time, okay, but to also make the students in the class who feel a bit anxious about the language get some reassurance from one of the better students. And I've had a lot of feedback from teachers over the years who say it's great because the point is students enjoy responsibility. They enjoy the praise that you told them they were good and they enjoy the responsibility of doing that, okay? So that's to help devolve responsibility. The next one, build confidence in groups, yeah? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Because 
I'm going to have to give you the microphone so that the, the gent because and also if it's on the film. Yeah. Okay, since we are at an IB school, basically most of our, our students take English B, a higher level, which requires an individual oral presentation where they need to, they have a, a prompt or stamina, and then they need to give um, an oral presentation on the spot. Well, you uh, what? 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 Hello? It is working. Is it working? Is it wor It's not working. Hello? It's very low. It's very low. <laughs> um, well, so you've, you've already answered our, the question. You've our got, problem got, you've got, is that they speak in Arabic because they're used to speak in Arabic in their English class. Yeah. So they end up recording their oral presentations with inno, yani, words in between that are Arabic because they're not used to it if we let right, them. Right. Like we have a chart in every classroom who speaks Arabic I, I got, in their think, English yeah. class. You have a very specific and quite a complicated problem to solve there, I agree. But if you say that most of your students are higher level, it's not working, this is it. I completely understand that as a problem for you. And, but you've already said that most of your students are of a high level already. So I think the, um, the circumstances are different. I'm thinking about general English classes where some students, you know, the, the real problem, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not really answering that question, but the problem about state education, the problem about state education, this has gone quiet suddenly. Anyway, the problem about state education is that everybody moves up a year at the end of the year, regardless of their ability. In some countries, students are required to repeat a year. Do they do that here? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Right? I think repeating a year is terrible. I think students should, stay, should, should always stay with the students of their own. But in most countries, they just move up. And, you know, they drag along the bottom, in, mostly in English classes and also in maths. And I've always been trying to find a way. You, you seem to have some la creme de la creme in your school, which is a different situation and, frankly, one I don't know anything about. But, no, you must, you must impose your own requirements. If, if this presentation has to be Arabic-free, then work on that. Absolutely work on that, definitely. This is, for me, not about presenting to the rest of the class. When they present to the rest of the class, it should be in English, right? That was my thinking. But I'm thinking about groups now, and particularly now we've got these nice groups of one good student and two less good students. Uh, I'm not imagining that's your groups now, but I'm going to um, give you a task to do with two other people, or three if it's easier, around the classroom. Stay awake, everybody. OK, I know it's, it's Sunday afternoon. You want to go home. I know your, your favorite dog is waiting for you at home and things like that. OK, but <clears throat> I want you to, with the people around you, Try and find three things that you have in common, but not your nationality, not your job, and not your marital status and having children, okay? So no family, no job. Talk to people around you and find the things that two or three you have in common. Things that you have in common. Come on, get the notebook out. Talk, talk, talk. You four there, you three there. Find things that you have, that you have in common. Things you have in common. Good. Okay, I'm going to, that sounded wonderful, there were smiles, there were nods, that's lovely. I won't ask you to tell me what, what they were, those things. But it's, an, it's also nice for the students if they're new to each other, or if they knew to group work. I'm astonished by how many teachers still don't put their students into groups. Apart from anything else, it's, it saves you energy. It really does save you some energy, it gives you some breathing space if you can find a good group work activity. This is a lovely one, the students. Uh, and your teachers, so I said nothing about your jobs and nothing about your nationality. But of course, with students who live in the same town, nothing about coming from this town, nothing about, you know, keep the local things away. But here's another an option. What makes us different? And I'm going to do this differently now. I'm going to put, I'm going to ask you all to stand up again, please. Last time, last time you have to stand up. Come on, everybody, stand up. We're going to go home soon. Up, everybody up. Oh, my goodness. Are you, are you, are you, are your students like this? Oh, no. Oh. Yeah. I love making 15-year-olds stand up. Okay, what makes us different? Now, I'm going to, and this time I'm going to do things about family. I'm going to show a fact about me. If it's true of you, then no. No, if it's not true of you, you sit down. If it's true of you, you stay standing up, okay? Are you ready? So if it's, n if it's not true, you sit down. I always get that wrong. First one, I have children. Wow, almost everybody has children. If you don't have children, sit down. Right, 
Wow, that's pretty good. So we have this in common. I'm trying to find what makes me different from the rest of you, okay? I have grandchildren. Ha ha. <laughs> oh, well, that was easy. I'll think of something more difficult, more easy next time. Oh dear. Oh dear. My next one was I was born in August. <laughs> So it's unlikely in your teenage class that it will stop there, obviously, right? But here's, here's uh, you know, I've just wrote down five facts about me. And each of them can write down, I think this is probably unusual for me, right? Um, I'm a season ticket holder at my local football club, was my next one. And I can play the guitar. So usually with a group of people, I'm the only person in the room about who all those things. Are Would you like to see my grandchildren? I haven't seen them for a long time and I miss them. Now, oh, that's two of them, and that's the other two. They're cousins, right? So that's Sen and Sadie, Morris and Freddie. Ah, oh, you're such a nice group of people. Yesterday, I asked the people to say ah, oh, and they, they, they went oh, okay, because I showed, I showed my nephew's daughter. Okay, now, the next one. Find out what your students already know. Now, tell me, first of all, do your students use a course book like that? A textbook, a course book. Do they have a book in their hands? Okay. Now, textbooks are pretty good. Uh, I write them, as you know, so that's why I think they're good. But they are also a bit of a problem. They, they can become a barrier, okay? Uh, particularly if you're telling people stuff they already know. There are so many books to choose from. Even if you want a book by Ken Wilson, look at this. Just right. Ken Wilson, Carol Letherby, Jeremy Harmer, Anna Acevedo. Ken Wilson and three other people. This one is Ken Wilson and two other people. This one is Ken Wilson and one other person. And this one is just me. There are lots of books, even if you want a book by me. So there are lots of uh, books out there. Every one of these books on the inside page, sorry about the, the, the color of that, it's the contents page. The contents page of the student's book, what we call the map of the book. Who reads the map of the book? Do the students read them? Yeah, but do the students read it? No. So why is it in the student's book? Every time I write a new book, I say, why do we put the map of the book in the student's book when the teacher reads it, but the students don't? And the reason is always the same, that you go to a, well, you go to a, a conference or something, you go to a book exhibition, you flick through the book, you think, yeah, this book looks okay. Maybe you don't have that kind of choice, I don't know. But then you go to the front to make sure that the, uh, the syllabus, the grammar ah, syllabus, is what you want. But it seems a pity to me that the students never read the map of the book. So here's an idea. This is our new book. You're my new class. I kind of know, I think you know some stuff in this book already. Plus, the book was written two years ago. Some of the stuff in here is no longer true. It's been overtaken by events. So this is what I would do. <clears throat> Hello, class. Good morning. You have this beautiful new book in front of you. You've opened it at page one. Close your books, please. They go, what? Close your books. They go, close? No, no, open your books. That's what te teachers always say, open your books. No, close your books. Now, so they'll close their books. And then they feel a little bit naked. You know, I have got, no, got an open book. I said, I've been looking in this book, and I think you know some of the information in here. So I'm going to give you a list. What do you know about one of these? Great White Sharks, Formula One Racing, the International Space Station, Julius Caesar, New Zealand, Hollywood, Volcanoes, and somebody called Bethany Hamilton. And I say to you, my new class, I'm asking you now, does anybody here know anything about any of these topics? And the very brave one there puts a hand up. And the rest of you don't know anything? You don't know anything? I'll ask the question, now you're being lovely now, you're being very nice, I'll ask, I say, look, I promise I'm not going to ask you to say anything. Does anybody here know anything about any of these uh, topics? And still, three quarters of my students look very nervous at me, okay? Look, cross my heart and hope to die, as we say. Cross my heart. And I promise I'm not going to ask you to say anything. Do you know anything about just one of these topics? Put your hand up if you do. There are still people who haven't put their hands up. You seriously don't know anything about any of these, right? You don't know anything? Not everything, just one. Do you know a fact about one of these? Right? Do you know where New Zealand is, right? Right. I say, that's great news. Now, I want you to write down on a piece of paper a fact, not an opinion, not I don't like Formula One racing, a fact about just one. And don't worry if it's not true or you're not sure. 
Uh, okay, just one. So everybody, come on, get a pen. Write down a fact. And I promise I won't read it. When you finish it, you can eat it if you want. Okay? <laughs> just write down. Come on, get a piece of paper and write down a fact. Get something out. Come on, get a pen out. And you don't have to discuss it. Just write it your own Write your own, your own fact on a piece of paper about one of these. And I promise I'm not going to read them. Okay. One fact about one topic. One fact about one topic. How we, everybody's looking a bit worried now. I promise it doesn't matter. Nothing, nothing terrible. No, they're looking really serious. <laughs> Has everybody written a fact? I can't hear you. Is anybody written? Yes or no? Yes. Who said no? Nobody said no. Right. Now then, what I want you to do is to look at other people's facts. Okay? Just look at what other people wrote down. And if you don't know the fact or can't read the writing, ask for some more information. Ask the other people in the room. <laughs> look at what other people wrote down. Okay, and now I say, would anybody like to tell me what somebody else wrote down? Yeah, <laughs> see, and now everybody puts their hands up. Yeah. Julius Caesar was a Roman emperor. Fantastic answer, brilliant, excellent. Mm -hmm. Celebrities live in Hollywood. Brilliant sentence. Any more? Mm -hmm. Yanni. <laughs> Oh, that's a fantastic sentence for a beginner's class, isn't it? No, that's great. No, that's brilliant. These things are self-regulating. They will write what they can. And that, what happens next? I then say, okay, can you open your book at the map of the book? Because all, this, all these topics, not necessarily all this information, is somewhere in the book. <clears throat> Look through the map of the book. Find the unit which is about your topic. It might not be easy to find because it might just say danger for great white sharks, okay? And then go, and then I, then I give you a post-it. What is a post-it? A sticky note. What color is it? Yellow. I like pink ones myself, okay? <laughs> pink ones are nicer than yellow ones. I give out yellow or pink post-its, and I say, write it down. Go to that unit 17, unit 14, whatever it is, and stick it on the front page. And then six months later, you reach unit 17, and you have three or four post-it notes around the room and you say to the students, what did you write six months ago? And you make what they wrote more important than the first page of the unit. And they feel really strong about that. What, me? Well, aren't we going to read this? No, I want to know what you wrote six months ago. It's a lovely way to involve the class, to make the book feel like a real book. Okay, <clears throat> those are the topics. You may not have heard of this last one, Bethany Hamilton. Does anybody know who Bethany Hamilton is? Yes. Yeah, you do. That's absolutely right. Did you hear what she said then? Well, why are you looking at me? She's a <laughs> Sorry, this is a terrible... Often what happens is somebody says, I say, that's absolutely right. Did you hear what she said? And everybody looks at me and says, no, repeat it, you know? So I'm going to let you tell us. Okay. Uh, Bethany Hamilton is a surfer who lost her arm in a shark accident in the sea. And then she, after that, she kept on surfing after losing her arm. I think, can I just say that our books these days have too many celebrities in them. And the thing about celebrities is that they change their hairstyle, they get divorced, they do all kinds of terrible things after you've written about them. You know, I write about somebody, the book comes out two years later, and by that time the celebrity is either dead or has changed their hairstyle. I think it's much more important to write about people that people don't know about who've had amazing lives. This, as you say, is Bethany Hamilton. Her arm was bitten off by a shark. And 
Four weeks later, she was surfing again. She was even competitively so. I think she's an admirable person, and she's worth writing about in a book. Did you also know when she went to the hospital, in order to get her into the emergency room, it was her own father who had to wait for an operation. He was having an operation on his knee or something. How what a bizarre thing to find out. Oh, we can't operate on your knee because your daughter's just lost her arm in a surf. Can you imagine how he must have felt? Oh, I hope they didn't tell him. I hope they didn't tell him. But she's an admirable person. I think we should write about interesting people who've done admirable things. That's just a, a by the by. Okay, we're getting towards the end. Flip the lesson. Does anybody know this expression? The flipped classroom, flip the lesson. Don't worry if you don't know, I will try and explain. In simple terms, flipping your class means doing your homework before the class and not after. Doing your homework before the class and not after. So at the end of the class, you give your students something to do at home, which is not about what you've just done today. It's about what you're going to do next lesson. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to imagine that you're my class. Okay. You are my class. You've been a lovely class today. Okay, gang, before the next lesson, look at this man. Look at this man and decide, talk to each other if you like, decide what you think he does. What does he do? What does this man do? Not what is he doing, what does he do? What's his job? Anyone want to guess from looking at him? A journalist. Okay, good idea. Anything else? Hmm? No, 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 a singer. Why, why not? Because he's bald. Are you suggesting that singers cannot be bald? Or wear glasses, that's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? No, right, he's not, okay, maybe not a singer. You're right, he's not a singer. Maybe, yeah, coach, some kind of professional sports coach. He look, or a trainer, yeah? Okay, can I show you another photograph of him? Oh, first of all, there's his name, Yves Rossi. Yves Rossi, write the name down, because you're gonna have to find out about this guy before the next lesson. And before you go, in case you think he's very boring, here's another picture of him. Oh, good response, good response. I like that response. Oh, okay, he looks a bit different now. <clears throat> Very strange. Now, your homework is just go and find one fact about Yves Rossi from the internet. I don't care where you find it, what language you find it in, I'd like you to say in English when you come back to class, okay? Yves Rossi is something, okay? And I also want you to find another image of him. So find an image on Google Images of Yves Rossi, copy it, bring the fact and the copy to the next class. And, they, and uh, also, while you're thinking about it, here is a decontextualized word list. I told you not to give decontextualized word lists. But these are words I need you to learn before the next class. I don't care how you learn them. If you have an electronic dictionary that translates directly into it, that's fine. That's fine. Some of you will prefer to learn new words by going directly to your internet-based uh, dictionary or your, <coughs> your, your, you know, your dictionary machine. I have absolutely no problem with that if that's the way you want to learn the words. So they come back the next week with their image. There's another image of Yves Rossi you would find if you went online. Looks even more interesting now, doesn't he? Right, more interesting than being a singer, that's for sure. And then I open the book and there's an article in the book about Yves Rossi. Now, your students aren't stupid. After two weeks of doing this, they'll go, I bet it's in the book. This guy must be in the next reading text. So they go and they read it, and maybe they translate it word for word. That's how some of your students feel better about doing language. You can't stop them translating word for word. And if it stops them feeling frightened by your teaching method, then that's fine. They turn up at the class, they have the fact about Yves Rossi, they have the image, which I asked them to do, Probably they've also read the art, the thing, because they thought, oh, this looks look, really interesting. And they found renewed interest in the reading text, you see? So that's called the flipped classroom. Um, this is a very good article I recommend you read if you don't know about the flipped classroom. It's from a website called ELT Jam. ELT Jam are a bunch of very interesting young guys who are interested in helping us learn about technology and education. The article is by a guy called Laurie, you can't see his name there, Laurie Harrison. I'm going to give you the web reference for where the, um, um, it appears. That's the, the name of their organization. And you can write that down to read about the flipped classroom. It's a bit more complicated, the idea of the flipped classroom. But basically, do your homework before the class about the next class. Don't base your homework on the class you've just finished. I really recommend you read that article. OK, we're getting near the end. <laughs> Have you all written that down? Okay. Number six. 
You're going to love this, you language teachers. I recommend that you walk in one day and say, let's have a maths class. Yes. <laughs> no, no. You, you're English teachers. You're not, you don't like, but some of your students prefer maths to English, okay? I say, come on, guys. Let's have a maths lesson. Ooh, not sure about that. Today, we're going to learn some maths. Is that okay? Or math, if you're an American English speaker. And your students are going like you are. No, please, please don't. I say, well, look, we're going to start with something we call mental arithmetic. Mental arithmetic is doing some sums in your brain, okay? Are you ready? I'm going to give you... It's really, really hard. No, it's not. It's not hard. It's really simple. But the point is, please don't say anything. Do not say anything. Please remain silent. If you want to write something down, that's fine. But I want you to do this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Big yes. Come on. Yes. Okay, we're, all, we're going home soon. We're going home soon. Think of a number between two and nine. Shh, shh. Don't even say okay. Think of a number between two and nine. Have you thought of the number? Now you can say yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, are you ready? Multiply it by nine. Don't say a word. Have you done that? Yes. You, can, you can say, <laughs> no. Come on, multiply it by nine. That's the easy part. Have you all done that, yeah? Okay. Now you have a number with two digits. Can you please add those two digits together? Add the two digits together. Have you done that? Okay. Subtract five. Okay, good. Now, think of the new number you have as a letter of the alphabet. If your number is 1, it's A. If it's 2, it's B, etc., etc. Okay? So you now have a letter of the alphabet. Have you done that? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> think of the name of a European country which begins with that letter. The English name of a European country which begins with that. Shush, 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 shush. Okay, have you all done it? All right? So, no, no. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll, we'll catch up in the end. So you now have the name of a country in your mind. Now then, think of a name of an animal which begins with the second letter of that country. An animal whose name begins with the second letter of the country. Okay? And finally, think of a typical color for that animal. So now you have a color, an animal, and a country in your mind. Have you? Okay? So my question is... Are you thinking of a grey elephant in Denmark? Aren't you impressed by that? You're supposed to give me a round of applause. That's brilliant. That's just brilliant. <laughs> now, that was mental arithmetic with English combined together. You see? Right? Huh? Yes. <laughs> At first you go, yes, it's everybody. It's everybody. Now, now, the ones who understand maths will now explain to each other why it works like that. Why does it work like that? Can nobody explain it? Yeah. Yes, he's gone. We need a mathematician. Huh? Yeah, which is what? 9, 18, 27, 36. I said, I said uh, add the two digits together. Add the two digits together. Multiples of nine always add up to nine. Nine, 18, 27, 36, 45, 54, 63, 72, 81, 19, 99. 18, nine, right? All multiples of nine. Isn't it? You, you didn't look very uh, impressed by that. Yeah. Students are going, wow, like that. Hmm? I don't get it. You don't get it? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. No, I'm serious. I'm All right. I'm supposed to get the same answer. That's number one. Number two, I have a problem with math. Yeah. But you're good at English. You see, you're good at English. Yeah, but you're good at English. In the class, in the class, there are some kids who are good at maths who are not good at English. They will love this, you see. Multiples of 9, 18, 27, 36, 1 plus 8, 2 plus 7, 3 plus 6, they always add up to 9. They always add up to 9. <laughs> did, you get, did you get Denmark and stuff? Yeah, right. Okay. 
Okay. But you see, that's funny because you see, you're now thinking, I can't do this, like you're in a maths class, but you're in an English class where you're good at English, and the kids who are, have a problem with English enjoy that because they're good at maths. You'll enjoy this even more then. Okay, that was kind of easy. So I'm going to give you a brain teaser. Look at those equations, for want of a better word. Read them and explain them to each other why those numbers are there. Look at the examples and try and work out how those numbers became the answers. Talk to each other about it. <laughs> okay, we'll tell, tell me. Is, look, this is really important, but don't sit in silence. Allow yourself to be told about things by other people. I know you're adults, you think, I should know everything. Nobody knows everything. Nobody knows everything. If you don't know what's going on, ask somebody around your table. Okay? Okay? So now, in your groups, here's another set. Can you please give me the answers to these? Give me the same kind of answer as the first column for these ones as well. You've got two minutes. Come on, quick, quick, quick. Write them down. Write them down. I love watching people work. You're doing a really good job. That's really nice. Nice atmosphere of hard work. But I'm running out of time, so let's do the answers, yeah? Huh? You're done. Excellent. Well done. You can go to, go, to the go to the tables where they're not done. Okay, let's look at the answers. The first one. Okay, you agree with that? What was the answer to the second one? 1218. What's the, what's the last of the third one? Yay! Now it's the fourth one. Okay, next one. Okay, and the last one, the biggest number. Well done, you see. Can you see that in your class, some of the kids will find this really comfortable to be doing that? And they'll be doing it in English, and they'll, and they'll say, hey, he's brilliant at maths. We've never heard him say anything in class before, but listen how good he's... Hmm? The wrong one. Is there? What? Is the one that's a mistake? The one before, 21 plus 15 is 36. 21, oh, it's 6. Ooh. Oh, God, it's wrong. Sorry. I'm, I'm no good at maths. <laughs> Thank you. I'll change that before the next one. Now, so quickly, moving quickly on. Okay. Here's a strategy I gave you yesterday as well. Do something unexpected. Now, I want you to shout out these words, okay? Shout out these words starting here. After Yellow. three. One, two, three. Yellow, orange, blue. Come on, everybody. Wake up. This is the last thing I'm going to ask you. Stop, stop, stop. Start again. Start again. Right. Here we go. Yellow, orange, blue, black, green, red, yellow, purple, red, orange, green, yellow. Very good. Now, I want you to shout out the color, not the word. The color, not the word. Okay? Green, blue, red, yellow, black, blue, blue, red, green, black, red, purple. Some of you, that was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> no, that, I mean, most students find that really hard to do. That's really good. It's a bit of a waste of time, but it's easy. Or, you know, it doesn't matter if it's difficult. Okay, I'm going to quickly finish. Now, I just wanted to quickly show you, because we started off with the things I used to dread, that I asked um, my Facebook friends to say what they liked about their teacher so we can show some things which we can carry on doing. I used to love getting gold stars for primary. Primary kids do like, I mean, there's a big argument in Britain about whether we should give stars like this, but kids do actually like it. 
and they remember it. I used to love it when our teacher gave us brain breaks. He had an innate sense of our attention spans and knew the exact moment he should stop mid-sentence and tell a joke, sing a song. So give your students brain breaks, brain breaks. Everybody needs a brain break halfway through the lesson. Our French teacher used to tell us about her experiences of her year abroad. So this girl, Sandy, had a wonderful romanticized image of her teacher sitting in a cafe in Paris as a student, right? That's nice. Tell the students things about your life. They love it. They really do. And I used to love it when our teacher remembered or would follow up on what one of us had said or written in a previous lesson. That's so important. Do you remember what you said last lesson? That they seem, you know, sometimes every lesson is like a brand new thing. And so, you know, think that we're all living in one world. I'm going to quickly go to the end now. Used to bring pictures and made us stand up and say what we saw. I got a puddle of mud one day, and I didn't know the word mud, yet I told you it was a chocolate porridge. I was so terrified that she would be angry, but instead she laughed so hard and hugged me and thanked me for seeing outside of the box. Seeing, I love that expression, seeing outside of the box, looking at a bigger picture. So these are things that our students like. <coughs> Rearrange the patterns of the desk, make the, the room look a bit different. Okay, do whatever you can to sort of change the way the students respond to the, the uh, environment around them. Right, exams. I want to just very, very quickly, we all love exams, don't we? Students love exams and teachers love marking exams, okay? <laughs> but I want to show you a lovely exam question and answer. You can't see it very well, I'll do it again. The question is, explain how a nitrogen atom in the upper atmosphere becomes useful to an archaeologist trying to determine the age of a bone. <gasps> God, can anybody do that? Nightmare, what a nightmare. I'll read it again. Explain how a nitrogen atom in the upper atmosphere becomes useful to an archaeologist trying to determine the age of a bone. And this was given to some 14-year-olds, I think. And here was the answer. Oh, I can't read it. It's almost unreadable. It says, I, I have to be honest with you. Uh, I didn't go over the problem last night and didn't pay attention to it in class yesterday. I do not care about this. I don't even like science. But, this is nice, but I do like you, and I don't want this to ruin our friendship. Since I do not know this, I have um, a question to ask you. I just started texting this girl, and I know she thinks I'm cute, but I don't really know how to start a conversation with her. So I was wondering if you have any ideas. Well, that's all for now, Mr. J, but we'll keep in touch. <laughs> Isn't that a lovely answer? And what did the teacher write? Remember, the question is, the question is, how does a nitrogen atom in the atmosphere become useful to an archaeologist? Okay, he wrote, impress her by talking about how atmospheric nitrogen can be, can be used to age artifacts. It works for me every time. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Okay, exams are just nightmare. Okay, one final thought. There are so many different kinds of, um, there are so many different kinds of. Uh, learning theories and teaching theories and what you really need to remember is this it's your class and your students okay and they are way more important than any methodology that people say so start where you are use what you have and do what you can is a pretty good starting point you know if you think that this methodology is not going to work that's because your class is different just think about the class first right so this is why I thought stop teaching grammar, devolve responsibility, build confidence in groups, find out what they already know, flip the lesson, teach math, and do something unexpected. Just little ways to try and make the class different for students who might find it a bit frightening to be in your class. And I'm sure you're such lovely people, none of your students are frightened of being in your class. Okay, that is pretty much it. That is my blog. I don't blog very much, but there's lots of old stuff on my blog that's quite interesting. Ken Wilson ELT at wordpress.wordpress.com. Uh, um, that's on Facebook. I hope you're all members of Facebook. Facebook is a very good place for English teachers to be. Some wonderful free materials, downloadable materials. What is it? You have to hand those out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, start handing them out now. Start handing them out now. And that's my email address if you want to tell me how terrible you think my ideas are. And that's it. So thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you. <laughs>